contributes to newspapers and the television. Our other speaker today is Davide Casti, who is Professor at the Department of Mathematics, Physics and Computer Sciences at the University of Parma. Um, in addition to this, he's also a musician and um, a renowned expert in scientific cuisine. I think that's all the time I need to say, so I'll hand over to our speakers. So thank uh, World Scientific for organizing this and thanks to Professor Cassie for accepting to discuss uh, this, uh, this book with me. Uh, I think uh, uh, you, can, you can start, Davide, with your questions. Okay, I start uh, immediately. <laughs> So the first uh, very natural question is, uh, how was the idea of this book born? And how did you choose this very particular title? Thank you. Um, the idea of the, of the book uh, on this topic, science and cooking, came from this uh, program that is well known to Italians it's called Super Quark, and it's a, it's a very popular program with the, about science in prime time with an audience uh, three, four, sometimes even five million, which is which is quite good for a for a science program. So in 1998, they started this section on uh, la scienza in cucina, science in the kitchen, and. As a sociologist and, and trained also in the history of science, I was immediately fascinated by the fact that uh, such a popular program was, was dealing with science and cooking. And you see already that the chicken was in my destiny because this is what they chose to, to present in television. So I decided to, I, I, back then, I decided to write a paper for a, for a conference on that topic. But in the following years, I realized there were so many uh, other examples of using uh, cooking and the kitchen as a, as a gateway, as a, as a mechanism for presenting science to the general public. So these are just some examples of books and, and a game, a game for children, uh, which is called the laboratory in the kitchen. The, there are so many examples. So I started to collect these examples. And then I um, gradually understood that there was a long term story to be told, a long st term story of intersections between science and cooking that started from the very beginning of modern science. Uh, this is from 1682. It's a, it's a book. Uh, on the left, there is an instruction for dissecting. You see, like a, in an anatomical uh, uh, theater, a boiled hen. And on the right, there's a textbook for the English housewife. And the first point mentioned are the skill in physics. Hmm? So she, she had to be skilled in physics. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is, uh, I think we will come back to this point, there's a whole trend of uh, books like La Physiologie du Goût, we are now in the 19th century, Pellegrino Artusi, which is a super classic of Italian cuisine, decided to call his book, 1891, La Scienza in Cucina, Science in the Kitchen. This is an, an example from the same years, but from America, Villa Kellogg, Science in the Kitchen, and so on. Um, so particularly since the, the end of 19th century, early 20th century, this, this was a very strong movement. And uh, important scientists like Liebig, Liebig was a chemist, he was also an entrepreneur, uh, were using um, science as a way, for example, to promote their own products. Uh, Liebig was producing these cards to be collected uh, for, for advertising his own meat extract. And uh, uh, scientists uh, um, like Claude Barnard were comparing in their, in their memoir uh, laboratories and um, 
and Kitchen. This is a beautiful uh, uh, citation from Bernard, uh, where he says, if I had to describe what a laboratory is, uh, I would say that it's, it's a ghastly kitchen. It's a smelly kitchen, but to get to knowledge, to get to the beautiful salon of knowledge, you have to go uh, through, uh, through this kitchen. So uh, I, I realized there was material for an interesting book about the intersection of science and cooking as a gateway to understand the relationship between science and popular culture. But how to put this together? Uh, and this is the, the structure of the book. Um, uh, the menu uh, was, was, in my view, the ideal way of putting together these interesting examples and story. So the book uh, starts as, with a starter. Then there is the main course, the science of chicken. This is your, your other question, Davide. Why Newton's chicken? Uh, of course, the subtitle uh, of the book uh, and the working title was always Science in the Kitchen. But as I said, it couldn't be called Science in the Kitchen because uh, Artusi book, which is certainly much more famous and important than my book, and is translated in, in many languages, was already called Science in the Kitchen. So I had to find a different title. And, and I had, as you see, a, a whole chapter about the chicken. The chicken comes up in, uh, in many ways in science for a, for a number of reasons. Uh, the Enlightenment scientists are interested in, in the chicken. Uh, we have the famous story of Bacon's chicken, Francis Bacon, who is the, the, the um, uh, great... Uh, uh, um, one of the first champions of modern science is said to have died by trying to freeze a chicken and so on. So for me, a good title could have been Bacon's Chicken, but then the publisher objected that not many people know who Francis Bacon is outside of the history of science. And, uh, and so we decided, because there is an interesting story that uh, maybe we will tell later, about Newton and, and the chicken. So we ended up with choosing Newton's chicken. So to, to finish my answer, I will, will just show the other two uh, chapters. There's a chapter about drinks, hmm? wine, coffee, beer, chocolate, and scientific controversies. And there is a dessert um, about the particularly the, the late 19th century and the 20th century. And finally, there is a digestive, which is the brief section, the final pages, where I give my interpretation. And, I, and actually, I explain why a sociologist uh, or someone like me who is studying science and technology in society um, is interested in the intersection between uh, science and cooking. So. This is, um, this is my early reaction to your question, David. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's very, very nice and very curious, uh, this fact uh, of the chicken, because uh, I remember then uh, that uh, when we started uh, studying the, the new technique of uh, service temporal preservation of food, uh, we just started uh, with chickens. <laughs> so... <laughs> it, uh, it happens that chickens are a very studied object in scientific gastronomy. So uh, now I noticed that you mentioned different historical example of uh, the evolution of the relationship uh, between science and cooking. So I ask you, can, can we identify some distinct specific historical phases uh, in the development of uh, these relationships between science and cooking? Yes, and this is actually, uh, as I was mentioning before, why uh, all these stories of intersections between science and cooking um, are interesting for me and hopefully to the reader. So what I, what I show in the book through this menu 
is, is a sort of alternation of historical phases. Uh, we have to think in, in uh, um, the 17th century that science, which was not even called science because scientist, for example, in English, it's a word that it starts to be used in early 19th century. Um, 1833 is one of the first uh, cases when, when scientists use it to talk about themselves before they, were, they would call themselves people like Newton or Galileo or natural philosophers or, or in other words, but, but not, not scientists. So science is, is a new thing and it, it becomes natural for these early uh, modern scientists to, to apply their new methods and their new way of dealing with knowledge to food because food was something uh, that was naturally interesting for, uh, for everyone and particularly for uh, um, uh, the rich people who were sometimes supporting the scientists. So people like, for example, Francesco Redi, uh, which is considered one of the founders of modern biology, they, they find, found it natural to, uh, for example, advise the Medici family on, uh, uh, on food or to use food as a way to make uh, science relevant. So, for example, where when these new drinks like tea, coffee, chocolate come uh, to Europe, uh, scientists are very keen to try to understand um, whether, these, whether these new drinks are beneficial, whether they can be dangerous, uh, whether they, uh, particularly when consuming excess, what is their effect, uh, and so on. So there is a phase uh, where, where cooking is used by scientists as a, as a source of legitimation or as a way to present themselves to society and culture. Then, uh, particularly in the 19th century, there is, a, there is another interesting phase. Science is becoming something important. Science is becoming something appealing, fascinating. You can think about uh, the novels of Jules Verne, for example. No, there is a science has become a source of inspiration, even for literature. Um, an epic uh, of science is 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 part of the cultural climate of the time, and and this is part of the reason why people like <clears throat> Artusi uh, who didn't have a scientific training but was in touch with with the important scientists of the time. Uh, why he decided, no, it's quite a strange thing. Uh, his book is a book of recipes. It's a book of recipes that tries to merge um, uh, recipes from different parts of Italy because Italy had just become uh, a nation, a united nation. Why does it call it the science of cooking, uh, science in, in the kitchen? Um, of course, it was part of this uh, trend and, and uh, fascination for, for science. Then there is, maybe <clears throat> we can spend a few words later on about this, the futuristic cuisine. Uh, uh, the futurists, uh, starting from Marinetti, are, are very fascinated by, by cooking and by the possibility of uh, approaching cooking from their own uh, uh, perspective. And then, uh, Davide, you know this much more than, than myself, um, we are in the, in the late uh, 20th century and to our present times, uh, there is the so-called molecular gastronomy and there's a whole trend and movement of uh, um, applying um, the new sophisticated uh, findings of science to cooking on one hand, but also, and this, this is part of what, for example, uh, Super Quark and, and Piero Angela were doing with that, with that uh, program, uh, using cooking to explain, explain science. So these are the, um, the different movements, which, um, as I said, my book is not about cooking per se. And uh, if you look for recipes, except for some uh, recipes by Reddy and other scientists, you might be disappointed. It's a book about the history 
of uh, science in society of, and science in popular culture, which uses cooking as a, in, in my view, as a fascinating gateway to, to understand how these relationships have changed over time. Very good. Uh, so you show, have shown uh, many interesting examples showing also that uh, during these historical periods, uh, the attitude uh, of science toward uh, cooking and kitchen in general changed a lot. Uh, so uh, now I'll ask you, uh, what are, according to you, the key elements uh, that have produced these changes from one historical phase to the next? And are they connected to the changes in the attitude of science toward cooking? Thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, for example, as I was mentioning before, if we take this um, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is uh, the Physiologie du goût uh, by Bria Savarin, which is considered a classic uh, 1825. Uh, Bria Savarin was not a scientist himself, but again, he was fascinated by science. And he had this idea, the program of this book is that uh, cooking must become a science, must enter the pantheon of the scientists. And it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the book starts with a sort of aphorism where Bria Savarin says that for the benefit uh, and of mankind, a new recipe is more important, discovering a new recipe is more important than discovering a new planet. So uh, cooking has, uh, has all the rights to acquire the status of a science. And, and then I mentioned Artusi. So in my view, uh, this phase is significant because it embodies, it, it uh, incarnates a broader, a broader season of, um, of, so, of uh, uh, cooking using science to legitimate itself. Mm? So uh, the, the situation is reversed compared to, to early modern science. To, uh, the, the idea is here that science has become so important that if cooking wants to become important, wants to become something respected, it has to become scientific because uh, that, that is the model. And uh, let me give you another example, uh, which I mentioned before with futurism. Hmm? Uh, yes, this is the manifesto Manifesto of Futurist Cooking, which is also available in English. Um, you will find in the book several excerpts. Um, the first point is very interesting, and it's, it says, enough with pasta. Hmm? Futurists, uh, despite being Italians, they want to abolish pasta from the menu. And why is it so? A and the whole, the whole manifesto uh, I will show you some quotes without reading word by word. You can see that um, they don't understand anything about science, but science and technology um, are an aesthetical model for them. Mm? Uh, modernity, progress is identified with knowledge, with science. And so cooking has to follow this, has to adapt mm, this model. So. For example, the Italian bodies has to be fit for the aluminum trains, uh, for the way they imagine technology. And this, this imaginary of, of the futurist, um, if you think about it, has been very powerful, for example, in, in shaping um, science fiction, science fiction thinking about food, for example, in terms of pills. No, if you remember uh, Stanley Kubrick, 2001, Odyssey, at some point uh, in the space station, uh, food comes in the forms of powders, pills with strange colors. So this is the way, of, and obviously we know today 
that this this uh, this was a completely wrong uh, forecast. That actually we have gone back to um, traditional local food in some sense, even if, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, there are all sorts of different trends. But again, this is, uh, as I said, this is an aesthetical idea of the uh, of science and technology as a model. Uh, the last example I want to, uh, to give is, oh, sorry, David, you wanted to say something? No, 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 please uh, go, go on. The last example has to do with Newton, as I promised. <clears throat> and uh, so the, I'll, I'll briefly tell you the story of Newton's chicken. It's a chicken actually that Newton didn't eat. Uh, because he had invited for dinner his friend, Stukely, and, and Stukely came and, uh, and Newton didn't show up. He was busy, he was immersed as usual in his uh, studies and thinking. So Stukely got hungrier and hungrier, and at some point <clears throat> he, he got so angry that he opened, there was a lid, there was something covering the food to keep it warm, and so uh, Stukely finally opened the lid and, and ate the whole chicken mm, and just left the bones of the chicken. And when, when um, uh, Newton finally came into the room, he opened the lid, he saw the bones and said, oh, I, I didn't remember that I already had dinner. Uh, as philosophers, we are so distracted. Um, so this this story, which might be true, is is told by by several biographers of Newton. But whether it's true or not, it incarnates um, a very powerful image of the scientist, which will become again will become very important, particularly in the second half from the second half of the nineteenth century. So the idea that uh, the scientist is disincarnated, is, is an ascetic figure um, that is so, uh, so much uh, involved with, uh, with thinking, with uh, spiritual um, and, uh, and uh, intellectual activity that doesn't care about food. Mm? And this ideal, <clears throat> this is also very interesting, is a, is a sort of lay um, remodeling of, of an old iconography of religious figures, no? the idea of the ascetic scientist who, who, uh, who didn't eat or, or didn't drink. And so we have, <clears throat> we have so many anecdotes and stories uh, of scientists who were forgetting to eat, like Newton, who were always eating the same thing, um, wonderful stories of Pasteur who was continuing to do experiments, sometimes even in the kitchen, and, and forgetting to, to, or delaying the, the time to go for dinner. So um, th that's another way in which uh, food uh, comes into the, into the popular image and the public perception of scientists. <clears throat> Thank you, and... Uh... Now I have uh, some, uh, just a few last questions about the present and the future. The first one is that uh, now we are living in a very quickly changing, changing world, mainly in the scientific uh, framework. So in the last period, after the writing of your book, uh, have you noticed some important changes with respect to the past? Um, what I see today, but Davide, I would like to hear your view because you are <laughs> you're very active in this uh, uh, in this area. Uh, in my understanding, today we have both movements. So we have uh, science using cooking to to popularize itself, uh, to make itself more understandable and popular. But at the same time, we have cooking using science and the technology associated with science 
to make um, more sophisticated, more appealing, more fascinating, but hopefully also better food. So maybe maybe here, David, you can you can tell us a little bit of what is going on. No, really, I agree, I completely agree with you on the fact that then now, at least uh, in our country, but I think also in many other countries, cooking is more popular than science. So science has to, to use cooking to get more popular again. And uh, th I think this is a, a little revolution because uh, just... Uh, a few years ago, in, during the 80s, the organizers of the Erice meetings, in, uh, among which uh, the, the, the first meeting on molecular and physical gastronomy was organized, said that the original title, uh, Science and Cookie, was too frivolous with respect to the usual uh, meeting organized in Erice. Now, the, the situation is completely different because uh, the, the common people like very much cooking and perhaps are afraid of science because uh, science is the science of nuclear power, the science of chemical pollution and so on. So, for example, uh, uh, Harvard University organized uh, starting 10 years ago, more or less, this course is uh, in uh, science applied to cooking, just using the kitchen activity to show, to, to, to make popular some basic uh, scientific ideas. So in this case, I completely agree with you. And uh, the other fact uh, that's very interesting to me is that now a growing movement uh, all around the world uh, is asking to, to make uh, scientific gastronomy an official discipline to be teach and, uh, and uh, learn uh, in university. So, you know, we just discussed um, two days ago about this uh, Barcelona manifesto asking to all the wo world uh, scientific and uh, teaching authorities to include scientific gastronomy in a common curriculum or study among uh, other scientific disciplines. But one, uh, one other thing is that uh, scientific gastronomy is an independent discipline, taking uh, ideas from all the other scientific disciplines, but having is uh, proper principle, that, that's uh, the real point. You cannot uh, study gastronomy just uh, by studying chemistry or physics or biology. Uh, we also have to include uh, some uh, psychological aspect, cultural aspect, anthropological aspect, uh, and so on. So I think that the, the, the birth of a new discipline will be the, the next step in this evolution. And also a new harmony between scientific and non-scientific discipline in a more human perspective, I would say, because, you know, we are Italian, we are Latin, we have a humanistic background. I think that you too will agree with me. Yes, yes. I think also that that would be an interesting uh, point of observation, no? of sociological observation, this uh, uh, idea of uh, a, a humanistic vision of, uh, of uh, science uh, cooking and of, of science in general. Uh, Davide mentioned the, the beginning of uh, molecular and physical gastronomy and I want to show you um, on the left, uh, this woman, Elizabeth Caudry, is, is one of the people who, who got this uh, whole thing of molecular gastronomy started uh, because he visited Erice for a conference um, with, with his husband. And, 
And there he met an Italian physicist, Ugo Valdre, and they had this idea of, uh, uh, of a seminar about science and cooking. But as Davide was saying, uh, the um, putting together science and cooking uh, seemed to be too frivolous for the uh, Erice host. So they had to come up with, some, with a title that sounded more scientific. And they came up with uh, molecular and physical gastronomy. And this molecular gastronomy, which then remained in the in the lexicon, didn't have any, any substantial meaning. It was just modeled on molecular biology, who was the hot field, one of the hot fields of the time. And um, this, is, this is a picture from the uh, very first uh, um, meetings. And uh, in some of the topics, I will read you just, just to give you an idea what was the program of discussion. Um, foams, meringue, mousse, mousse, souffle, milk and cream, the role of microorganism in cheese, uh, microwave cooking, deep freezing, the perfusion of animal tissues, uh, bouillon, concentrating by boiling at reduced pressure. So it was, it was rather broad. And, uh, and uh, as I said, it was in general, the idea was that these scientists wanted to, to study um, cooking from the point of view of the uh, physical and chemical scientists, sciences. And uh, Valdré also launched an interesting challenge, uh, challenging colleagues to uh, find the equivalent, the, the winter equivalent of the ice cream cone, which he named the caldone. <laughs> So uh, something that could be eaten, uh, for example, while you are walking, that uh, not only the content, but also the container could be eaten and, and some other features. And uh, I think this challenge was never, was never solved by anyone. So if you read the book, you can maybe get in touch with Davide, who, who's, uh, uh, who can judge whether your proposal of, uh, of a caldone is, uh, is meeting the, the standards of Valdre. Uh, indeed, uh, Massimiano, something similar to caldone was, uh, uh, in fact, realized. Uh -huh. But it wasn't a success at all, because you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can produce uh, such a structure so using methyl cellulose, which gives uh, uh, gels at uh, high temperature and liquids at lower temperatures. But people didn't like the product. So it, it was a scientific, a good scientific idea, but not so good from the gastronomical point of view, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. I think we have uh, time for a few questions. Um, yeah. If Natalia, I haven't seen in the chat if we. Yes, we've been getting um, we've been getting a few. Um, there are, there is time to answer lots of questions, so do keep them coming. Um, but to start with, um, I was wonder I was wondering, Massimiliano, if you could explain the picture on your background. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a picture from the Nobel banquet, uh, 1958. Um, there's a brief mention in the book uh, to Nobel banquets. Uh, of course, this is an occasion where uh, some of the top scientists of the, of the world gather around the table. Um, and the, the, um, there are lots of publications about the menus of the scientific banquet, which are, which are quite interesting, which are an interesting combination of tradition and innovation. Um, what is also interesting, which I mentioned in the book about Nobel banquets is, uh, is about coffee. Mm? Uh, coffee also uh, has a special place in, uh, uh, in science. Um, 
for example, when, when scientists gather with colleagues to have a coffee and discuss ideas and projects and experiments, but also the, at the time of coffee, when the dinner gets to the time of coffee, is the moment at the Nobel banquet where the scientist who has received the prize has to make a speech and uh, a speech to, to thank for the prize, but also this speech sometimes is an occasion for uh, saying something about uh, science in relation to society, politics and culture, and sometimes also about food. And uh, uh, so this is why I chose this, uh, this nice picture. Um, Frederick Sanger was uh, um, uh, among the laureates that uh, in that year, Boris Pasternak, uh, maybe, maybe the two more, more well-known. So um, it's, it, it's again, it's an interesting occasion to, to see science and cooking and uh, science and food from another point of view. Okay. I can see a question in the chat. Yes, um, about food and art. Um, so it'd be good to get both of your opinions on this. Um, so the question um, talks about how food is also art and how the way food is presented influences how it tastes and, um, and how that um, is a great way to bring art and science together in the classroom. Uh, very interesting question. I will give a couple of brief uh, examples and uh, maybe then Davide can say something also. Uh, let me show you something. Can you still see my PowerPoint? No, I'll stop sharing so you can. Ah, okay. There you go. So I... I would like to show you this. Um, here you are. Uh, so share. This is from uh, the Encyclopédie from, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. a moment. Oh, here it, here it is. Uh, this is from uh, Encyclopédie by Diderot and, and Alambert. And there's a, there's a long entry in this uh, uh, work about uh, chicken. And this is beautiful art, artwork describing how to, um, uh, how to raise and breed chicken. And chicken in some way is the ideal um, uh, application or, or the uh, the breeding of chicken, as you can see also from this image, but it's uh, well described and also in another work by Reumur uh, as an, an example of the application of reason to the, uh, in this case, to the production of, uh, of meat and, uh, and food. And the other example I want to give you is an example where uh, knowledge and aesthetics of food are, um, are combined. And it's a, it's some, it's a uh, quotation from the notebooks, the laboratory notebooks of uh, Francesco Redi, which then he sent in a letter to a friend. Uh, so Redi, as I said, in the late seven, uh, 17th century, he, he, he was doing what is today called comparative anatomy, so doing experiments and dissections of animals. And he had dissected a deer brain. And so before he, he, he threw it away, he, he thought, why, why not cooking it and, and eating it? Uh, and so he, he said, I took the risk. And his servant was embarrassed to, to cook this because nobody was eating deer brain. And he said, I had the whole pot full fried in virgin lard. And, uh, um, and so he, he ate all of it. And uh, in the quotation, he says, 
this brain seemed to me chubby, beautiful, healthy, and substantial. So uh, it, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful fabric. It has to be good. So here, um, uh, Reddy uh, is, is doing something very interesting. First, he's bringing something from the laboratory to the table. No? And then he's also uh, combining uh, an aesthetic judgment with the taste judgment about, uh, about the food. And he's also doing an experiment by trying something which is, which is typical of the, of the attitude of science, partic scientists, particularly um, at the beginning of science, challenging prejudices and stereotypes. Nobody is eating this brain, but why? Who has said it is not good? So um, I know I haven't responded to the complex question of art and science, but I, uh, I, I think I gave you a couple of examples. And then of course, the other example is the Futurist Manifesto, where the fascination for science is, is, uh, is completely about the aesthetics of science and technology. <clears throat> That's very interesting. Um, David, do you have any, any, anything to add there? Yes, I think that uh, a good uh, connection between the, the science and art in cooking is uh, the modern field of food design, uh, where, uh, as usual, in design, you have to combine and harmonize uh, technical aspects and aesthetical ones. Uh, here, uh, aesthetical means uh, not only uh, things that you can see, but also things that you can taste. Uh, so you can uh, look at it uh, simply from uh, an artistic point of view, but you can also study the psychological effects uh, of uh, the presentation of a food uh, in a particular situation. So I think that a, a very good uh, reading uh, to this uh, respect is uh, the book of uh, Charles Spence, uh, which title is uh, Gastrophysics. Charles is studying uh, these uh, psychological and cerebral connections between all the aspects of the gastronomic experience. And uh, this is a, a good example of how the modern scientific gastronomy must be multidisciplinary, but also something more, so something different. You have to take into account all the aspects of a human experience. You have to take into account that when you are, you are eating, there is a relationship between a person and the food. A person not uh, intended as a, an organism, but uh, as a cultural subject, a psychological subject. And this is a very intriguing and uh, fascinating uh, new field of investigation. Cool, thank you. Um, our next question comes from someone who's in Scotland. Um, so it's good to know that we're, uh, that our audience is so <laughs> spread out. Um, it's about, um, so about studying food and science. Um, how is the study of socio-cultural practices for science in society carried out in Italy? Do you have any current examples where you link university research in cooking to public engagement work for undergraduates and postgraduate students? Thank you, this is uh, obviously a very interesting topic. My short answer would be no and uh, I, I think we, uh, with people like Davide, we should collaborate more between social scientists and people who actually uh, work with, uh, with food and with the science of food. But uh, again, maybe Davide has... Um, I, I was aware of the, um, of the faculty uh, near Ivrea, Davide, where they do gastronomic sciences, but I don't know if yeah. they actually do what the question asks. Uh, indeed, uh, in Italy and also in other countries, we have uh, some uh, courses in uh, uh, 
gastronomic sciences, but the, the single disciplines uh, aren't new at all because of bureaucratic reasons. You can uh, design a new degree, but just putting, uh, taking uh, existing courses from uh, other disciplines. So what it lacks now is a specific discipline called scientific gastronomy. Because if you are studying gastronomic sciences, you take courses in physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, agriculture, everything connected to food, everything connected to gastronomy. But it doesn't exist a specific discipline called scientific gastronomy. It doesn't exist an academic discipline called gastronomic physics, gastronomic chemistry, gastronomic anthropology, gastronomic psychology, and so on. So what we need is the birth of some new discipline organized from a different and completely new point of view. That's our idea. Cool, thank you very much. Um, my next question, um, so I know that Maspiano, you, you mentioned a little bit about why a sociologist is interested in, in cooking and, and you can expand on that as well if you'd, if you'd like to, but I was also wondering about Davide, your, um, your mixture of, uh, interest, so music and, and also, um, physics. Mm -hmm. no. Yes, uh, <laughs> from my personal point of view, our uh, academic uh, courses and the curricula and so on now are too specific and in some way too old because the disciplines we are studying now are uh, more or less born uh, two centuries ago. And now the world is different. Uh, now we can uh, obviously speak of uh, physics and chemistry, but uh, we have to consider also some system as a whole, not uh, just only from a specific point of view. So from my personal experience is uh, very differentiated because uh, when I was younger, I studied music. Uh, I studied uh, a lot of different things uh, which aren't scientific. Then I had to choose a, a specific course at the university. So. I was uh, very uh, keen with physics and I chose physics, but uh, I didn't drop uh, all my interests. And uh, as it was common uh, for uh, every scientist uh, many years ago, I introduced all my interest in my work because it's very common. I think, for example, a very, very famous uh, scientist, uh, Helmholtz, who was a physiologist, but also a physicist, and wrote the first uh, physical treaty about musical acoustics. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was possible in a, in a scheme of uh, cultural uh, uh, interest, which, uh, which was very common uh, last centuries, during the last centuries, but now we are living in a world, uh, in some sense, too specialized. So these new relationships between science and cookie is a good idea to change this attitude, this over-specialization, and to recreate a, a, a more equilibrated and various cultural framework, I hope so mainly in our ac academies, in our universities. I don't know if uh, Massimiano agrees with me. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. The, this is, uh, I mean, the, on the one hand, the uh, hyper-specialization is inevitable in, in science, is part of science uh, growth as, a, as an endeavor and as, a, as an activity. Um, we are, today uh, we should never forget that we are, we are not talking anymore about 
the times of Newton or uh, Reddy, we're talking about uh, six million uh, professional researchers worldwide. But of course, the price you pay for uh, hyper specialization is what exactly what Davide says that uh, uh, the 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 links and connections between um, dimensions which are obviously connected in everyday practice, as they were for I mean for Reddy, there was no uh, there was no reason to disconnect his food interest or his or his uh, gluttony from uh, from his laboratory knowledge. No, but but of course today uh, it would be very embarrassing for a scientist to to finish and and probably he would got in trouble or she would get in trouble for. Uh, eating what uh, what is left from the experiments, no? <laughs> so um, I I fully agree, and um, and and yes, this is uh, this is certainly a challenge uh, for uh, for science in our times. Well, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, we've had a question about. Well, certainly something that pops into my mind first, um, if I think of science and cooking, um, mayonnaise. Um, and I know you, you mentioned that in the, at the start of your book. You could tell us a bit about mayonnaise. <laughs> well, on, on how to make mayonnaise, uh, I think you, you better ask Davide. But yes. no, my interest for mayonnaise is precisely because in the TV program, this was... Uh, taken as a, as a, as an, an area where to challenge uh, knowledge of lay people no so um, why mayonnaise sometimes uh, comes up and sometimes doesn't come well so they were asking this question to people receiving uh, mostly naive answers and then they were explaining the science of the mayonnaise why why mayonnaise actually uh, works by putting together two liquid things, no? uh, oil and lemon, uh, and, and you get something which is, which is not so uh, liquid, but it's, uh, it's, it's more like a more solid cream. Uh, and so it, it was an interesting uh, strategy for downgrading common sense. No? How, do you, how do you show people the importance of science this is a typical strategy. You downgrade common sense, and and then science comes to enlighten uh, and and show that you have been doing things without knowing why. No, so this is this is the communication strategy of that program, which I find interesting as a sociology because it implies a certain ideology of science, a certain ideology of of the public. But um, if you want to know how to make mayonnaise, you better ask David, not myself. <clears throat> My boy struggled with it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, given that this isn't, as you said, it isn't a recipe book. Um, should we finish our, our Q&A session with a very, um, oh, we've just got a new, um, We've just got a new question in just in time, um, actually, to be asked. Um, nowadays, science has been under more um, exposure to the media than ever. Um, how could you? How could this book be used to enhance science's um, visibility and awareness in society? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't understand completely. Can you repeat? Sorry, I've read it too fast. Um, so science is un, uh, in the media everywhere at the moment, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, this, uh, this person is, is wondering how this book could be used um, to play into that and enhance science's visibility and also our awareness of it. I think, I hope the book uh, provides, uh, I mean, um, as you understood, there is a historical sociological argument underneath, which I, which I hope it's clear and important. But of course, you can enjoy the stories one by one and discover fascinating stories about uh, scientists in relation to, to food. So the book was constructed like a menu, so you can decide to pick just one course and uh, 
so this is one way of reading the book. But uh, I think another, another way of um, approaching this book or uh, enjoying this book, hopefully, is as a uh, um, demonstrating how science is, uh, is part of culture. Um, and science communication is not just about um, giving a certain message no? or providing a certain content, but it's also about uh, enjoyment and uh, fascination, like for other elements of culture. Uh, so uh, sometimes I find this argument that we should communicate science and persuade people that innovation technology is a good thing. Of course, that's, that is part of science communication, but uh, uh, we should never forget that uh, science uh, in a, in a different way, but in a similar way to literature, uh, music, uh, as David was uh, mentioning in response to your question, is also something that can be enjoyed for, uh, for the sake of enjoyment and cultural enrichment. And I think the, the book gives several examples. And, uh, and of course, again, we come to the question of specialization and humanism uh, in many uh, many stories of the uh, of the book. There is a one I like very much, but we don't have time to tell it here. So we, you will have to read the book. There's a very nice story about Benjamin Franklin and beer, uh, and uh, the the scientist um, scientist had this. Uh, for a long time in history, at uh, this uh, strong sensitivity for the culture of the time, for being citizens of the time and being able to connect the, the different dimension, dimensions of the human experience. So even if they had a distinct interest, they were, uh, they were able to, um, to connect their work uh, and their knowledge with, with what normal people were Another, another striking example is Pasteur. I mean, Pasteur, when he started his scientific career, immediately understood that he could have a great success by putting his method to the service, for example, of winemakers in France and solving their problems with wine, with wine going acid. Um, or, um, so that is my answer. <laughs> well, that's... Um... Yes, that's very interesting. And as you mentioned, um, buying the book, which I very much encourage everybody to, we have a, um, a discount running. I'm just going to share the screen. Um, so as you can see on your screen, um, you have 30% off buying this title on our website until the end of March this year. So you go to our website and you put in this code WSNewton30. And it will um, it will give you thirty percent off, obviously. <laughs> um, and don't worry, I'll send um, uh, an email after this with details of the discount and also um, of the recording. Um, and yeah, so we're very neatly at the end of this um, webinar. So all I need to do now is is to thank everybody. So first of all, thank you to our wonderful speakers for a really interesting hour. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's really enjoyed myself listening. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to also to our audience um, for being here and also asking wonderful questions. Um, and yeah, remember to use the discount code. See you again tomorrow at the webinars. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalia and Davide and all the participants. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.